All right, so we are going to start our flash talks. How many of you have an understanding of what is flash talks? Raise your hands, please. That's it. All right, so we have, each of the speakers are going to just get five minutes to talk about anything that they are passionate about, things that they have built, they want to share with this group. Um, and we out of we got close to 10 or 15 submissions, and we have selected five or six. Um, so we are going to invite one of them, each of them, one by one. They'll come here, just talk about five, something on, on, for five minutes, and uh, you guys have to see what they are talking about. So the first one is Karan Thakkar. Hi, guys. How are you doing? How was your day? Cool? It's going to be awesome now. All right. So I'm Karan Thakkar. I work at Crowdfire as a front-end dev. And I'm here to uh, tell you how we decided and why we decided to move to Ember uh, from AngularJS. So uh, before I start, how many of you use AngularJS for production? Quite a lot. And how many of you use Ember.js? Oh, quite a few. Yes, cool. How many of you know Ember.js? Have heard of Ember.js? Great, great, great. <laughs> All right. So uh, to give a uh, quick background, uh, back in January, uh, Crowdfire started rebranding to uh, uh, we started rebranding and we wanted to revamp our website. The legacy code was in backbone, and we had to make a decision whether to go with Angular or any of the frameworks. Most of us was, uh, were comfortable in Angular JS, so we started coding in it. After like uh, ten days or so, we had a team meeting and we decided to lay out points which is better, is, is this the right way to go. And we uh, decided to switch from Angular to Ember. And I, I'll tell you why we did that uh, pretty fast. So if uh, you have used AngularJS, you know that there is no, it's a non-opinionated framework. So there is no directory structure that is uh, defined by the core team of Angular. So most of the AngularJS projects that you see, each would have a different uh, directory structure. So if there is a new team member that is coming to the team, joining the team, uh, let's say he knows AngularJS and has worked on uh, AngularJS before, it would still take him time to uh, understand the structure, how the production build is made, the grunt file, and all that stuff. But with Ember, that is not the case. I'll tell you why. Also, uh, in AngularJS, uh, we, Crowdfire had to in our application, we had to uh, render a lot of uh, list views. So we had a long list of like 1,000, 5,000 uh, items. And with AngularJS, because it uses dirty checking, uh, it was after 2000, uh, 2,000 bindings or so, it became slow. The actions uh, and the clicks that uh, it took, uh, took a lot of time to execute. So uh, that was one of the reasons. Also, the most important thing was uh, the Angular 2.0 version was coming out uh, by end of 2015 or something. And we were rewriting in January. We didn't want to rewrite again in a year or so. And so that was one of the reasons that we uh, moved to Ember. Also, if most of you are into uh, test-driven development, setting up your test uh, infrastructure with Angular takes a lot of time. You have to figure things out for yourself. Uh, if you want to deploy to production, you have to write your own grunt file and all that stuff. So a lot of things went into consideration, and that's why we uh, chose Ember over Angular. And now I'll try to list out why Ember is a little superior over Angular, yes, in some uh, aspects. So uh, the biggest advantage is Ember, if you have reused Ruby on Rails, so Ember moves along the same lines. So uh, there's a lot of convention over configuration. So uh, let me give you an example. Let's say there is a posts route. So in Angular, you would have to uh, define a controller in, in your Angular router. You will have to tell uh, this, is the, uh, this is the controller that would uh, execute this route. This is the template that would be rendered for this route. Whereas in Ember, let's say you have a posts route. It automatically assumes that uh, the, route, uh, the controller for that route would be in the controller's directory with the name posts.js. Also, the template would, uh, would be automatically uh, 
resolved by looking into the directory called template slash post dot h hbs. Uh, it uses handlebars for uh, templating. So uh, there's a lot of convention involved, and you don't have to figure things out for yourself. The directory structure is uh, already set for you. Also, uh, Ember, if you are working on an Ember.js project, uh, there's a command line tool called Ember CLI. It, uh, it's like a full-fledged uh, full uh, toolkit uh, for building, gen uh, building and deploying Ember.js projects. So you can uh, use Ember CLI to generate your routes, generate your controllers, and uh, you can use it to deploy. Over? All right. Uh, well, I didn't get to complete a lot of it. But yeah, if you have any doubts uh, about Ember.js, why you should use Ember.js, uh, you can find me around. Yeah. Thanks, Karan. Yeah. I've come here to talk about HTTP2 and why the web needs it. So some of the best practices that we have followed over the years have actually become anti-patterns for HTTP2, and I'm going to show that why. Okay. So if you see over here, <coughs> uh, the last HTTP1, okay, it's been 19 years since HTTP has been updated, and things have changed significantly over then. Okay. The web pages now have become more intensive than ever before, okay. which means we are putting additional loads on the server as well as the client. Okay. And HTTP 1 was not built okay, to handle this kind of load. And also, HTTP does not uh, use TCP optimally. So what that means is we are not able to take full advantage of the powers and processing of the TCP. Okay. So now what you've realized over the years is the requests are expensive. Okay. So developers have come with various workarounds. So one of them is spriting. So in spriting, what you do is basically merge all those small, small images into one large image. Then we started doing inlining. Inlining is instead of fetching separate files, <coughs> putting, uh, fetching them separately, what you have done is embed one into the other. Okay? But this comes at a cost. Resources cannot be cached independently. Then we started concatenating all the small, small JavaScript files into one big file, okay? which makes it more uglier. Okay? So every time you make one change, you have to download the entire file again. Okay? And this was actually an annoyance for the developers. Then another workaround was domain sharding. Okay, this was when one of the two overcome one of the limitations of the browser because browsers have this that they can use only six to eight connections per host. Okay, so then we started using allies names to allow more connections. Okay, here's one interesting chart <clears throat> I want to show you. Uh, the first one is just look at the top graph. Okay, the latency. Okay, if I move from one Mbps to five Mbps you get a fairly significant wins. But if I move from 5 Mbps to 6 Mbps, I hardly get any percentage improvement. Okay? And what if I double my speed from 5 Mbps to 10 Mbps? I am hardly gaining anything. But look at the chart below it. Okay? This is about a latency. As you improve the latency, okay, you are getting a linear moment of performance. Okay? So this is actually what the Google engineers try to attack. Okay? They try to identify from where uh, the... Uh, how we can decrease latency from the source. Okay? And that gave rise to the protocol which we call as Speedy. Okay? So HTTP is nothing but it's built on top of Speedy. Okay? Here we are using only one TCP connection as against we open around 30 to 40 connections today. Okay? And it improves the speed. Uh, and as per the initial test that we have shown, it improves the speed around 30 to 40 percent. Okay? And what makes this faster is <clears throat> one of the examples over here. So what you see on top is HTTP 1. Okay? You have the, the post, uh, the header, also along with the message okay, into one component. But if in, in HTTP 2, these two are broken. Okay? What this means is <clears throat> you can send them indep independently to the client okay? as and when they are ready. Okay? And also, they can be interleaved. Okay? They don't need to be in sequence. Okay? Those, now, this is one of the features of uh, HTTP 1. Okay? On the left-hand side is HTTP 1, and this is the HTTP 2. HTTP 1 suffered from a major issue that is called a head-of-line blocking. Okay? If one request was taking a significant amount of time to respond, okay, all the future requests, okay, they were getting delayed. Okay? But this, HTTP 2, this problem was solved in HTTP 2. Okay? We need only one single TCP connection. Okay? And you can send in as many requests as you want. Okay? And as and when the responses are ready, the client sends it back to the <coughs> sorry, the server sends it back to the client. Okay? 
which means there's only one connection needed. Okay, the request can be out of order. Okay, they they don't need to follow a particular order, and plus they can be interleaved. So this was one of the major reasons why SD2 became fast. Okay, another reason was header co compression. Okay, so look at look at this example over here. The, every you, suppose you are making a hundred different requests. Okay, to the uh, server, you are repeating this data. For example, user agent. Okay, so every time you are sending hundred different uh, user agent which has the same value, that is Mozilla something. Similarly for cookies, if the cookies don't change, we are sending the cookies again and again. Okay, so there's a lot of repetitive data over here. So what H, uh, HPAC did is they not only compress this data, okay, then they came with this very interesting concept over here. Okay, they formed a table. Okay, so say, if, say for example, user agent they gave it an ID of 14 and another one cookies is 24. Okay, so this table was maintained both on the is maintained both on the client side as well as the server side. Okay, so now what happens is if the server knows that it's go, the browser knows that it's going to same the send the same user agent, uh, agent again so instead of sending this full value of name and value it is just going to send this id okay so you are space saving a lot of space over there similarly for the next one it's just going to send this id 24 okay third feature was as a server push okay so say for example the user request for a html okay what you get in return is not only the html but also you get the css as well Okay, this is similar to the inlining problem that we had. Request one thing, but you get its dependencies also. Okay, and uh, the only problem was it uh, problem is it's restricted to the single same origin resources. But this gave an opportunity for servers to become more smarter. Okay, the push was based on based on the traffic pattern. So what is the impact on the developers for HTTP2? Okay, HTTP2 does not modify any of the semantics. Okay, the semantics remain the same. Okay. The headers, the requests, the methods, everything's going to remain same. Only thing that is going to change is the binary, binary format. Okay, instead of text, you're going to send data in the binary uh, binary format, which means basically you will need time to debug your applications. Okay, and one last thing is the workarounds which you did in HTTP one will be hurting the uh, in HTTP two. This is the last thing. Uh, another thing was the <laughs> <laughs> thirty seconds. Okay, just thirty seconds. Okay. <clears throat> Can I use HTTP2 now? Okay, all the major browsers have shown support for HTTP2. Okay, including IE Edge. IE Edge has support, and you can see Chrome, Firefox. Okay, all have shown support to HTTP2. And these are the list of servers that have started showing support to HTTP2. Okay, yeah. So the takeaway over here is, uh, as and when your favorite web server uh, starts supporting HTTP2, I think you should give it a try. Okay, to improve the web performance. <laughs> Uh, we built a bot called NodeBot. Uh, the idea behind this was that uh, we wanted to link, we want to see how IoT links with JavaScript. So what we did was we took a um, Node, we, we took Node.js as a platform, and uh, basically we took a Raspberry Pi, uh, which is just a Linux box, and we took Arduino, which is a microcontroller board, and a motor driver to control the motors. So we linked all three of them using Node.js. So basically how it works is, uh, uh, this will be explained by everyone you. So yeah, so we are getting a lot of requests regarding how the bot actually works. So it uh, has uh, myriad uh, technologies involved in it. So the basic thing is Node.js running on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is a small computer that is actually a Linux box. So you can do whatever you do with your Mac at home or I mean any other Linux uh, machine that you have. So you are running a Node server on there. So the Raspberry Pi runs a local node server. The user sends a GET request to that server. Now the GET request is something like uh, your uh, IP, then followed by the bot, and then WASOD, as you have in the FCS games. So if I do a W GET request, then it moves the bot forward, A moves it left, D right, and uh, S moves it back. So the second thing is, based on the request, the server communicates with the Arduino. Now this is the interesting part. There is this uh, awesome module called Serial Node. What it does is, it takes the signal, from your Raspberry Pi, from your Node server, and it sends it to the Arduino. Now, uh, actually communicating between these two has been a headache since a lot of years. But uh, since last year, there has been this module called Serial Node that actually helps you to code in, Node, uh, code in JavaScript and communicate with the Arduino. Or else you have to write the whole Arduino code in C and you have to do a lot of RxTx stuff. And that's, uh, that's a little into the electronic side. And the third thing is the Arduino interprets the signal and directs the motors accordingly. So we have the Arduino connected to a motor driver. The motor driver is actually a relay. The Arduino runs on 5 volts, the motor runs on 12 volts. So the Arduino signals the motor driver to provide the voltage 
to those motors uh, if they are to uh, if they are to move forward backward left or right so the fourth thing is the uh, if if a camera request is encountered the pi invokes the attached webcam so the webcam is directly attached to the raspberry pi if that is encountered it captures an image and tweets it as uh, you would have been seeing on the js channel uh, twitter handle so uh, that's about it regarding the presentation and thanks a lot so this is a small demo that we would like to give you Yes, has tweeted an image on the JSNL Twitter handle. You can check that out. It tweeted. Yeah, it has tweeted now. So you can uh, check it on the JSNL Twitter handle. Shall I? Okay. Yeah, so it just took a bit of time. We'll actually take one more. Yeah, this one is better. Thanks a lot. You can follow the GS Note board on the Twitter handle. That is GS Note. So our title is uh, using web components in uh, production uh, best practices. So uh, I'm not going to uh, give any introduction of web components and how they are, uh, what they are, and how they are used. So I'm just going to give a b brief description of uh, uh, our use case and our need to use components. So uh, basically, in our form, we have a plethora of uh, web apps ranging from built-in to us to too big to manage. So uh, previously, all of this was being used internally. Recently, we started serving external clients. For that, we needed a consistent look and feel. And uh, along the lines of this, we needed a central place to control our code, which is being distributed th throughout the form. So uh, basically, I mean, obvious question is, why not use a framework? because we didn't want to do a complete rewrite when some developers sitting miles away decide to change an API, Angular 2.0. So yeah, so for that, for the same reason, we are not using Polymer. We are using the native implementation of uh, web components. And uh, so we did a survey, find out the uh, f survey throughout our firm and found out the common use cases and developed widgets based on that. So this infra will be used uh, throughout the uh, form and it will be served as a platform. So uh, what are the challenges we faced uh, in productionizing web, web component? That's what we are going to share along with the solutions. So uh, basics, <clears throat> basic uh, challenge we fa uh, faced is ease of use. So basically, if you're developing a component and you, if you're developing a set of components, so basically uh, uh, the APIs and uh, event generation, everything. So basically, if, you are, uh, if one developer is using an input element, other one is using a different input, input element, both of them should listen to the same event. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying ease of use. So component developed by a central team should be easy to use throughout the form. Second is uh, maintaining maintainability and reducing the footprint. And uh, third uh, would be obviously to uh, tackle the lesser support across the browser. So we are going to take a look along the solutions. So uh, first solution, the solution to the problem for uh, ease of use. So basically we wanted to get everyone on board with using uh, our set of components. So it, we needed to show them uh, that uh, it's very easy to use a web component. So uh, so uh, the first thing would be, so we, we set out uh, deciding what elements should go uh, in, such, in some groups. So we created a bunch of elements like input elements, like uh, the elements which interact with the uh, server side and uh, uh, things like that. So uh, the challenges we faced there were, so we basically needed uh, uh, some sort of uh, standard practices across all our components. So uh, we, uh, we decided on, uh, so, uh, so the approach that we take while creating a component is we first design the API 
and uh, that API needs to follow st uh, some standard conventions and the uh, API of some set of uh, elements should be uh, closed. Like for all input elements, you'll probably have setting of options or uh, like uh, getting out the selected value by the user. So that is something we uh, put our thoughts uh, into. Then uh, for individual component, then this leads to a problem of code maintainability because we can make it easy for the users, but then uh, for, uh, uh, for us, it becomes a little complicated to handle all the components. So we need to have a code structure around uh, each of our component. So we, be, we followed standard JavaScript practices for writing the JS of those components. And so uh, we use module pattern, we used uh, things like, uh, uh, like we used uh, object freeze and seal APIs. So to avoid any uh, like malicious, uh, like addition or uh, removal of functionality from our components. Then we try to follow the gold standards of uh, web components. So things like uh, keeping the declarative and imperative, uh, 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 like both of the ways of using the component uh, close. There shouldn't be any mismatches. Then, uh, so for that we used, uh, we used private methods within uh, our component uh, design and uh, we basically sync both of the implementations to one method call. So then uh, other standards like uh, you can uh, you can attach or detach the component anytime you want and it should function well. So this is what we did for uh, ba basically making it easy for the users and uh, uh, at the same time uh, uh, keeping the code maintainability. So the second problem he mentioned was uh, minimizing the footprint. So we built a, uh, so we, we are using a basic uh, grant build ecosystem. So with that, what we get, uh, what we get is we keep separate files for uh, SCSS and our HTML and JS, and finally we collate all of them to form one single component which can be used. And then again, uh, so we have a set of components, and then we can merge them together to uh, uh, to a single file basically which the user can import. So with that, he just gets uh, all the components, and uh, we we, uh, we have that file minified, so it also minimizes the footprint. So the third problem that we talked, uh, so there was uh, another problem with our uh, approach. So we needed consistency across all our applications because we wanted our platform to look uh, like uh, unified. So uh, so what, uh, so basically distributing the components, we uh, chose an approach of CDN. So when we have a one minified, one single minified file, uh, which can be used for all the components, we adjust, uh, we uh, import that single file into all our applications. Uh, we distribute that using a CDN. So uh, with this, uh, so uh, we are planning to uh, use web components very much in production for our applications. And uh, so I would like to say that uh, they're not a thing of the future anymore. Thank you guys, thank you. So I'll directly get to the meat of it. Uh, I, I wanted to share this tip with everybody. This is, this is kind of a tip. Uh, when I kind of first came across Closer and Scope Chains, uh, the things were very cryptic uh, and I couldn't understand them properly. Then I looked at the execution model of JavaScript and sort of like reasoned from that point of view and everything became very clear. So here I have an example. In fact, this is some, something I scribbled this morning and I will have a JSBin example as well. So so just, just follow along with me and see this code example, very simple example and how it is kind of structured in the execution model. Uh, so let's say you have this, this, this code of JavaScript which defines a function A, inside that you have a written function B, and inside that you have another function C, and so on and so forth. We kind of will come to how the execution happens for these things. But, but first thing you should understand is uh, JavaScript is a load and go system, it's a text-based system. So the moment it, it kind of sees your script, it kind of tries to interpret it and execute it. So the first thing that happens is when it looks at the definition of A, what it does is basically it creates an object f of a in the if memory, you can see that. Uh, and that's pretty much about it. And then it just keeps it as a string. It doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't even, even know b and c exist at this point of time. When you actually make a call to a, it creates execution context for a, and that's what the block is. It's the execution context of a, and all the variables that are there are actually defined there. And that's when, when it's actually executing a, that's when it encounters the definition of b. And that's when it actually makes another object called function b, and then it kind of g gets a pointer back to the execution of a, which was already executing. This is scope chain, basically, and that's how JavaScript defines everything. This is what makes asynchronous programming even possible. Now, 
when I execute B and I have given explicit reference B1 here, so basically B1 is another variable which points to f of B. But then when I execute B1, that's when the execution context of B1 is in progress, it's in memory. And when, when this code is trying to execute B, that's when it, it encounters the definition of C and that's when it will create the object for C. So you have to understand that all A, B, C are not actually created in memory whenever you try to execute this code as long as you don't execute the function. And then whenever a new function definition is actually there, it kind of points back to the execution context of the previous function. Now, <clears throat> now what happens here is as long as you have any reference to any of these objects, which is actually a pure function, all the scope chains all the way up to the window actually holds, holds true in the memory. But then the moment you lose the reference, everything is gone. For example, over here if you see, the function C gets defined here, called here, and that's it. There is no reference back. So C just gets created, execution context gets created, and then it just gets destroyed immediately. But B1 is external variable which holds on to the execution context of F of B and then it, it kind of in turn holds on to the execution context of A of B. Uh, let's, let's take a very simple example of closure to kind of understand uh, how it exactly works. So, so for example, if I have to compose it a function called make adder, and I want this function to be generic enough that uh, you can pass a value and then I want uh, kind of the adder function to return a function, and, and that I can execute over and over and over again to see the result. So here if you see I have a function make adder, and that takes a parameter number and I have initialized sum to zero. And then I return a function add. So when I call make adder, that's when the add function is actually getting defined and whatever the context of inc and sum is, it holds on to that. So you can see I have created two adders here, adder three and adder, adder two, and I have passed two different parameters here. The moment I call these functions adder three and adder two, it kind of holds on to the execution context of the previous one. So it, it runs as if those, those variables are hidden. So you see that the first one returns 3, 6, 9, 12, and the second one returns 2, 4, 6, 8. And you can just kind of keep on doing that, uh, make more composable functions. All, only thing you need to know is as long as you can hold a reference to a function which is defined, the function itself holds all the references back uh, to the execution context. And that's how set timeout, your all event handlers, everything works. In fact, this is one of the core functionalities of, of JavaScript. Uh, one quick thing I want to sort of like show as well. So if I just copy paste the same thing in, in console, you can actually see the closure. Not a lot of people know about this, but, but take any example. If you just paste this out, the same thing happens. But if I do, if I do console uh, dot dir of adder three, for example, it shows me what this function definition is. But if you just explore more, you can actually see what the function scopes are. And then you can see that it holds the reference to the closure and the closure has that state with the function. As long as this reference exists, this closure will exist. And, and the only way to access this reference is through this function invocation. So pretty much that's, that's what I wanted to cover. It is not a lightning talk. It's a lightning quiz. So, uh, I'll ask question, you have to raise hand, answer it, and then you get this limited edition t-shirt, the one that we are wearing. So not the, like we are not going to remove it, we'll give you brand new ones. Okay. Uh, first one, seven built-in data types in JavaScript. What are they? Come on. Yeah, I mean, just stand up and speak up, yeah. Function is not a type. Function is also an object. Last one, I think. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, you made six, I guess. Uh, you can come over and collect the t-shirt. So these are the answers. First three are primitives, and the remaining ones are object, non-primitive ones. The symbol is what is added newly in year six. Next question, a value which is not equal to itself. Come on, come on, come on. So 
we have around 25 t-shirts so maybe per question we can give two or three t-shirts at the most otherwise we'll have to remove ours so it's nan when will this call me be called at least come on so it's at least can you explain why it is at least 1 millisecond yeah because it is single threaded and it is event driven env environment okay so you can't guarantee it next question four ways to alter this in a function call four ways yeah bind okay third fourth one but again that is also call apply or whatever using dot operator but then that is not altering the this that is what you are giving before dot last one fourth one come on guys new yeah come on who is it so it's new yep who said new come on collect the t-shirt all right what is this generator yeah come on so this is uh, so uh, we covered basic javascript and this is now es6 kind of questions so even next one is from es6 alternative of arguments object in es6 what is it so it is getting de deprecated in es6 so there must be something using which you can you know do something similar to arguments i hope you know what is arguments it is a array like object but not array triple dot yeah come on so it's called rest parameter or spread operator all right okay so what are these 6 to 5 babel but that is not the question okay question is 6 to 5 was renamed to babel that's the question why it was renamed to babel come on yeah you got it so it you know the world is moving so fast it supports it, it converts 7 to 5 as well so it was it had to be renamed to something else from 6 to 5 all right arrange this in chronological order like you are in kbc kon banega karodpati and it's fastest finger chronological order oldest first newest last come on so only person who is confident just stand up and say it okay no yeah no dojo yeah i mean stand up someone stand up yeah dejo jiguri backbone no not not backbone angular came before backbone so that's the wrong answer okay so anyone else want to try so orelia will go to the bottom uh, meteor react would stay as it is uh, it's dojo first so it's 2004 dojo 2006 jquery uh, ext.js 2007 angular 2009 backbone came after angular okay so it was it was you know growing in in google already uh, then ember meteor react all right so i'll, I'll keep this t-shirts for me uh, code name of angular 1.0 1.2 1.1.3 1.1 and 1.4 so there is some code names that are used inside google to name these so i'll give you a hint it is two words with a hyphen in between you know why hyphen because it is all you know hyphenated thing so come on 1.0 1.2 1.3 1.4 1.1 didn't had any name no no <laughs> so the first word it is like something super heroic okay so this one is a very difficult one 
uh, even I don't remember. So these are the names, okay? Nice. Last one, I don't want to even pronounce it, okay? I, I think I'll go, I, I'll, I'll, I'll not be able to do it. All right. Uh, so the, the, this is ReactJS era now. Uh, query language that you can write directly in HTML, in, in the view. JSX, okay. Uh, yeah, come on, I mean, collect the t-shirt. How can we uh, write HTML in JavaScript? So uh, we used to write JavaScript inside HTML, but now it is going the other way. We are writing, but what is making it possible in ReactJS? JSX, come on. And this is a tough one. What is the new ReactJS app framework? Relay, yeah, Relay is the answer. It was simple, I think, okay. Okay, so I'm from Zebia. I have to talk about Zebia as well. So where are our office located? Within India, outside India? Come on. Stand up. Gurgaon? Gurgaon? Bengaluru, come on. Amsterdam, okay. Three? Four, five, come on. Two more. So, uh, so uh, it's a Dutch company. Uh, so Amsterdam, uh, it's located in Hilversum, Netherlands. Paris, France, Boston, USA, and Gurgaon, Bengaluru. And now, this is not JavaScript. So, the, so why, why this is here, okay? I mean, there, there's some analogy that I'm going to build. Um, so this is Pluto, but this is not the question. This is the question. Mission name, the key date, it happened just a few days back. Uh, distance that it covered, the duration it took, and the number of moons it has. Come on. I mean, just stand up, I mean. Six years, no. Nine and a half years, yeah, okay. No. <laughs> distance, any, any guess, distance? These, these are the answers. So mission name is New Horizon. 14 July, it reached or passed Pluto. It was called flyby, 3 billion miles in 9.5 years, 5 moons. So here is the analogy. JavaScript is like Pluto, okay? Uh, Pluto lost its planetary status, you know, long back. And same was the case with JavaScript. It didn't have, you know, status of a programming language for a very long time. And now people are so crazy, the way people are crazy about Pluto nowadays, okay? so. And that's the idea. So what I feel is you should probe JavaScript, like there are you know, so many different uh, you know, uh, flavors to it, Node.js, CoffeeScript, whatnot, okay? So take any one of it and just you know, probe it. it. All it takes is a plunge, okay? And then we are hiring, all right? So just visit zbia.com or zbia.fr, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Pinakin.